Surgery for the brain was really not being done successfully. It was uh, certainly attempted. Um, several individuals, both in Europe and England and the United States, uh, had been performing operations on the brain. But it took um, Harvey Cushing's special compulsive approach and what would today seem to be very practical, single-minded, um, and rational techniques uh, brought those into the operating room, such as monitoring the blood pressure, monitoring pulse, um, using local anesthesia rather than general anesthesia because it was really safer at that time. He was such a, a prolific uh, individual in, in writing. He wrote a thousand words a day. Uh, so we know pretty much each day where he was headed uh, and what he was thinking about and where he thought this field should be, where this field should go. The collection of the autopsy brains actually starts with a, a specimen at Hopkins, a pathology specimen, because he was interested in looking under the microscope at his own specimens because he was classifying the things he was taking out. So all brain tumors, uh, which were unsuccessfully removed at that time, he began a system of classifying these tumors, both those that start within the substance of the brain, the gliomas, those that start without, uh, adjacent to the brain, um, originating in the meninges, called meningiomas, uh, and he collected those specimens. And when possible, uh, I will ask patients when and if they uh, pass on to um, donate their brains, and we'll try to collect and keep this classification going so that we can understand more about uh, the human brain and about the pathology that, uh, that affects it. So it began under those circumstances at Hopkins, and he just moved that, uh, that process up to the Brigham uh, when, he, when he came to Boston. Once Cushing had these 650 brains in place uh, and had moved them to Yale and they were part of the Department of uh, Pathology, uh, individuals came from all over the country, neurosurgeons, pathologists, neuropathologists, uh, came to study the brains and study the, the uh, slides, the microscopic slides derived from the pathology in the brain. It was just a part of every neurosurgeon's history of learning about how they could better operate on the brain. And they had to follow through with understanding the histology because it was part of their oral examinations. So this was, the collection was of educational value. And then you have many, many centers growing up all over the country. They develop their own pathology, they collect their own specimens, and all of a sudden the collection as a collection of uh, educational tissue was not as important. The collection of brains um, was in danger, but it's almost understandable how this evolved historically. They're taking up valuable space in the Department of Pathology. What are we going to do? Nobody's doing anything with these specimens. You know, are they really worth anything? Maybe we should just throw them away. And that was almost what happened. Somebody had, you know, the sense to say, well, if we can find a place to put them, you know, where we're not going to take up you know, potential laboratory space and potential clinical space, <clears throat> then we'll, we'll move them. Um, and that's where they discovered the sub-basement in the medical school dormitory in Harkness and moved them there where they sat for, for many years. Most of us you know, who had visited the, the brains a couple of times um, you know, were aware of their 
sort of historical, uh, historical value, but nobody was really motivated to do, there was no space and nobody was motivated to do anything uh, with this until Chris Wall, a medical student who came to me in the early 1990s, um, came and sat down and said, you know, there's this, there's this ritual that the medical students have recently been going through where they break in the door in the sub-basement and commune with Cushing's brains. And I said, well, that's very interesting. I didn't know about this. Uh, and he said, you know, really, they're, they're fascinating. And he said, the whole history is fascinating. I would like to take a fifth year and do my thesis, my medical school thesis, uh, on this collection. And would you mentor me with this? And I said, well, I'd be happy to. Let's go take a look at it again. And it was, you know, it was then that, you know, this, a single light bulb in the middle of this sub-basement doesn't illuminate very much. So we had taken some flashlights and, and Chris had noted these um, envelopes at the back of the room. The envelopes held 10,000 of these glass plate photographs, which are just incredible. For me, the moment I realized that the Cushing Collection was an extraordinary piece of medical history and sort of a time capsule in itself was when I was, uh, the glass plate negatives were brought to me and I was able to start printing them. And within the first contact, it, it was, you know, it's almost comical to say that, but it was an amazing moment to see this image come out of this glass plate because they're five by seven glass plates and those are extraordinary things to begin with. But the image itself was just breathtaking and stunning and also very emotional for me. It was a patient and his head was bowed down. You couldn't see his face. And he had some kind of strange, um, almost vein-like structures coming out of his head. Um, and I just was taken by the emotion and also the vulnerability of this person at, at their time of probably very difficult medical condition because most people who ended up under Cushing's care at that point were people who were in pretty difficult uh, medical conditions. brains was that they're in these extraordinary glass jars which we determined we could keep and that was important because it had labeling information the jars are beautiful they're an artifact in themselves so that was very important to keep them in that jar I thought we were going to have to take them out and put them in new jars to preserve them and uh, we sent the we sent one of the jars down to the Smithsonian to a glass jar uh, preservationist at the Smithsonian to say what should we put these in, you know, how should we deal with this? And the person was, you know, on the line immediately saying, well, you'll be crazy to do anything but keep these jars because don't you notice that they're crystal clear, that the lead and the way this glass was made in the, in the 19, early 1900s, uh, we, glass is just not made this way and it will never cloud uh, and the glass will be perfect and besides the original um, labels with um, many with Cushing's uh, writings on it were on those uh, on those jars um, so that in and of itself as uh, just a work of art uh, some of it in preserving the brains of people like Leonard Wood and the brains of individuals who were the very first patients to have a brain tumor removed or a pituitary tumor removed, of course, is invaluable to neurosurgeons like myself. Every jar has a label. The jars have names, they have numbers, the number of the specimen, the date that it was taken out. The art and the science of those jars is, uh, is invaluable and will continue to increase in value as the decades go on. Uh, we couldn't really move the brains or the glass plates or do the project, really start scanning until we had a place for them to go to. 
So the process of trying to find a place for these brains to go to after they've been in the basement was quite complex. And I began searching for uh, of people and a place to put the collection. Kenny, um, who's the head of the library at the medical school, met with Dr. Spencer and said, I think I've got a space for you. There's a place that's newly opened. It's in the lower level of the medical library, and I think we can put the collection in there. And that's when we got Turner Brooks, the uh, architect, the amazing architect who, as Terry and Chris and myself, just, you know, we all became very passionate about making sure that this collection was going to be preserved and we could find a proper home. Um, it, couldn't, it wouldn't have been possible without somebody of uh, Turner's stature who fell in love with creating a space for it. And he came up with a phenomenal, beautiful, breathtaking plan for that space. The center itself is a place where we will be able to um, revolve all of Cushing's collected books. His, he was, you know, he collected uh, so many of uh, first edition and second edition medicine and scientific books from 1450 to 1900. Uh, that collection in of itself is amazing uh, and maybe one of the best uh, collections of, of works such as this. Cushing was an artist also and he, he drew each of his operations, and he drew sketches of his travels, and he, you know, he, he just always kept in tune with his writing by accompanying it with uh, an, an artistic sketch. And so all of his, uh, of his art will come through the center uh, eventually. I think that the significance uh, of what we have in the Cushing Center now is, is threefold. One uh, is, just the historical preservation and the beauty of, uh, hard to believe that, that it's uh, beautiful, but these preserved uh, brains in their original uh, glass jars. Secondly, of course, are the photographs. Um, they are just unmatched in terms of their, uh, of their art. Uh, they portray the emotion of these individuals who are undergoing treatment for their often very fatal diseases, um, and over time that they too will be increasingly valuable. But I think the most important thing is that this is a collection that was not thrown away. It's a collection that is poignant because it's a physical, concrete piece of medical history.